We're going to read a portion of the Great Isaiah Scroll. This particular biblical manuscript is approximately 2,150 years old. The portion of the text we're looking at is part of a prophecy that was given in the late 8th century B.C., about 610 years before this scroll was even made. In modern versions of the Bible, this is Isaiah chapter 12, verse 2. And before we walk through a translation of this verse, let's begin with some context. Yeshayahu, or Isaiah, as his name typically appears in English Bibles, was a prophet who lived in the nation of Judah towards the end of the 8th and beginning of the 7th centuries B.C., during the reign of four of Judah's kings. In those days, the major military and political power was the Assyrian Empire to the north. Isaiah would advise the kings of Judah on how to navigate the wars and shifting alliances between the various nations of the region. In those days, a navi, or spokesperson, typically translated prophet, in the context of ancient Israel and Judah, were individuals Yahweh would use to speak to the people about specific situations. Although a bit of a crude analogy, you can think of them as functioning as Yahweh's legal representation. If you think of the covenant the nations of Israel and Judah had with Yahweh as a contractual relationship, then the role of the prophet was to serve notice that the people had broken that contract by disobeying its stipulations, thus incurring all of the curses listed therein. On the other hand, if they obeyed all the stipulations of the covenant, they would enjoy all of its blessings. The section of the book of Isaiah that we're interested in concerns a war that took place around the years 735 and 734. The king of Syria and the king of Israel formed an alliance and intended to invade Judah. Judah being nowhere near a military or economic power capable of fending off such an invasion was facing the possibility of being overrun. Isaiah advised Ahaz, king of Judah, not to go to the Assyrians for help. Instead, Isaiah told the king and the people of Judah to repent of their idolatry and return to Yahweh and rely on him instead of seeking help from other nations. Ahaz ignored Isaiah's advice. Instead of trusting Yahweh to rescue them from the impending invasion, Ahaz sent a bribe to the Assyrians. He looted Yahweh's temple of all of its gold and silver and all that was in the treasury. He offered it as tribute to the Assyrian king. Tokulti apil atsara, or as his name appears in the Hebrew Bible, Tigleth pil etzar. The Assyrian army then marched on Syria and captured its capital, Damascus, as well as capturing a number of the towns of Israel, making Syria a province of the Assyrian Empire and the nation of Israel just one of its many vassal states. Although Ahaz's actions stopped the invasion, he essentially made the nation of Judah, like Israel, just a vassal state of the Assyrian Empire, which would mean the Assyrians would be expecting regular tribute from here on out. The prophecy given in this section was given during the reign of King Ahaz and delivered in the royal courts of Jerusalem, the capital city of Judah. Isaiah told the king that the Assyrians in the near future will destroy the city of Samaria, and that would be the end of the northern kingdom of Israel and this would be judgment for the nation of Israel breaking the covenant, thus incurring all of its curses, which included being removed from the land that Yahweh had given to them as part of that covenant. Isaiah advised Ahaz and the people of Judah to repent of their idolatry and return to Yahweh, so that they would be spared the same fate as their northern neighbor. The idea was that when the people saw the fall of Samaria and the destruction of the nation of Israel, it would be a foreshadowing of what might happen to them if they did not cease their own covenant-breaking. Along with Isaiah's warning that in the future they would be subjugated by a foreign nation, he also describes an idealized future kingdom, a future when all the judgment for their covenant-breaking had already been endured and they would be reconciled with Yahweh. And instead of suffering all the curses of the covenant, they would enjoy all of its blessings. In this restored, idealized future kingdom, they would be ruled not by a foolish king like Ahaz, but by an ideal king. And God would gather together from all the corners of the earth a remnant of Israel and Judah, and he himself would dwell among them. And chapter 12 of the book of Isaiah is one of the descriptions of this ideal future kingdom. 
So when Isaiah uses the phrase, in that day, he is referring to a time after all the consequences of the people's covenant breaking have been endured, and they are now restored and reconciled with Yahweh. And when he uses the pronoun you, he is addressing Yahweh's faithful remnant in that restored ideal future kingdom. In that day, you will sing, I will praise you, O Lord. You were angry with me, but not anymore. Now you comfort me. See, God has come to save me. I will trust him and not be afraid. The Lord God is my strength and my song. He has given me victory. With joy you will drink deeply from the fountain of salvation. In that wonderful day you will sing. Thank the Lord, praise his name. Tell the nations what he has done. Let them know how mighty he is. Sing to the Lord, for he has done wonderful things. Make known his praise around the world. Let all the people of Jerusalem shout his praise with joy. For great is the Holy One of Israel who lives among you. Now returning to our manuscript, here we read, Hinach el el Yeshuathi, Eftach welo efchad, Giyutzi woh simrath, Yahyawah, Hayahi li, li Yeshua. Hina is an interjection that introduces a declaration. So we can just translate this as behold. El is a category of being that exists in the celestial realm. In the minds of ancient Near Eastern people, there was a subgroup of these holy ones or gods that ruled over individual nations and territories. And since we're talking about the God of Israel and Judah, we can go ahead and translate this with a capital, G-O-D. And it is doubled. Yeshua is the noun Yeshua, meaning something like a rescue, deliverance, help, or salvation. And it has the first person possessive pronoun as a suffix. So this is my salvation. Ivtach is the verb from the root betach, meaning trust. And it is a call imperfect first person singular. So this is I will trust. Wullo is a conjunction and a negation. So and not. Ifchad is a verb, and like the previous verb, it is also in a call imperfect first person singular. And it is from the root pechad, meaning to dread or be afraid. That is to be in a state of expecting horror. So we can render this, I will dread. This construction here is a hendiatus. That is, two words connected with and that express a single idea. So trusting and not being afraid are the same thing. They go together. Like if you were to walk across a bridge saying you trust it to hold you up and you're not afraid that it will collapse, is saying the same thing. Ki is the conjunction meaning because. Utsi is the noun for strength, plus the first person possessive pronoun, so this is my strength. Then wusimrath is the conjunction and, and the noun simrach, meaning song, plus the first person possessive pronoun, so and my song. This also is a hendiatus. Both these nouns together express a single idea. In fact, either of these two words that we are translating literally as strength and song can be translated with the English word might in the sense of power or ability. And given that the context of this section of the book of Isaiah is about trusting Yahweh in the face of a military invasion, it would be appropriate to think of these two words as referring to a fortress or refuge. But I think we'll just stick with a literal translation for now. Then we have a repetition of the divine name. This writing of the divine name with both the shortened form along with the full tetragrammaton is not common, but there are a number of occurrences of this in the Hebrew Bible. Hayahi, which is a verb from the root haya, meaning to be or to become. It is a imperfect third-person masculine singular. So he is. Li is the preposition meaning in regard to plus the singular first-person pronoun. So we can render this with to me. Then Li Yeshua is a preposition with the noun meaning salvation. And here this preposition is indicating that this is the object of the previous verb. In English, we do this sort of thing with just word order. So we can actually leave this Li here untranslated. So putting this all together, a fairly literal translation of this verse would be Behold, God, God is my salvation. I will trust and I will not dread, because my strength and my song are Yah, Yahweh. He is to me salvation. Now, there are a few ways that this manuscript we're looking at differs from the Masoretic text, which most English translations are based on. There are these extra alephs here, 
which are serving as long vowel markers that are not in the Masoretic text. Then there is this verb here, which we are translating as he is. In the Masoretic text, it is spelled quite differently. There, it is what is called a wa consecutive. So a lot of English translations will insert the word and. And there is the doubling of the word for God. As far as I can tell, it is unique to this particular manuscript. And another thing that is interesting here is that we see the scribe initially missed the first yod he of the divine name. And then he went back and squeezed it in. Now, none of these variations affect the meaning of the text in the slightest. I'm only pointing them out because they're interesting. Now, when it comes to the meaning of this verse, we need to answer the question, trust and not dread, what exactly? Well, when we put it into the context that we've already laid out, it becomes quite clear. In the previous verse, it stated, for though you were angry with me, your anger turned away. So what this verse is talking about is not being afraid of God's condemnation and wrath and trusting that when he says the price for sin has been paid, it is indeed the case. So Isaiah is not saying, don't be afraid in a general sense. Of course, that would be silly. There are a lot of things in this world that would be a good idea to be cautious of, or even simply afraid of. And being afraid of some things could even actually save your life. So it's not a simple, just don't be scared. So what Isaiah is telling the people of Judah is that they should presently be in dread of the consequences of their rebellion against God. For judgment is coming in the form of an invading army that will destroy the nation and take a portion of the population into exile. And there will be a whole lot of death and suffering that goes along with that. Isaiah emphasizes this by contrasting this current situation with its opposite. Isaiah's description of a restored ideal future kingdom, like we have here in chapter 12, is presenting a stark contrast to his current situation. This contrast serves to underscore the dreadful situation the nation of Judah is currently in. And he is also giving a glimmer of hope for the future by predicting that after all the suffering due to sin has been endured, there will be a new kingdom with a righteous king. But that future kingdom will not come until that price for sin has been paid. So when the price for their covenant breaking has passed and they've been reconciled with God, then they can say, I will trust and not dread. But before that price is paid and judgment is imminent, dread is the appropriate response. So because the people of that future kingdom will be keeping the covenant, they are the ones that will get to say, Behold, God is my salvation. I will trust and not dread. Isaiah's prediction that the capital city of Israel, Samaria, would be destroyed by the Assyrians came to pass in 722 BC. This indeed did serve as a foreshadowing of what was in store for the people of Judah. It was 136 years later that Jerusalem met the same fate as Samaria, though at the hands of the Babylonian Empire instead of the Assyrian. It is easy to see that for the remnant of the nation of Judah living after the exile, the book of Isaiah would have been a very important piece of literature, because simply everything Isaiah predicted about being subjugated by a foreign nation came to pass. Now in the time after the exile, the people would be expecting Isaiah's description of the Messiah and the ideal kingdom to come to pass as well. So you can say that the book of Isaiah very much fueled the messianic expectation that we find in Second Temple Judaism. The New Testament authors would quote the book of Isaiah extensively, for they saw Jesus as the fulfillment of Isaiah's messianic predictions. Even Jesus himself quotes the book of Isaiah to declare that he is the messianic figure of Isaiah's prophecies. And he was initiating the ideal kingdom that Isaiah described. The theology that emerges from Isaiah's prophecy is that the only cure for human rebellion and failure is for God himself to rescue us. This is indeed the Christian message, that Jesus is God himself as Isaiah's promised Messiah. And he took on himself all the consequences of human sin. So in him, the price for human rebellion has been paid. The Apostle Paul, in his letter to the Romans, lays out his explanation for how Jesus' death and resurrection is the cure for the human propensity to fail and rebel against God. In chapter 8 of Romans, he describes the result of Jesus' actions on those who put their faith in Jesus. In verse 1 of that chapter, he states rather succinctly, Uden nun katakrima tos en Christo Jesu. Literally translated, no, as a result, now, 
guilty verdict, the ones in Messiah Jesus. Or, consequently, there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. So, for the Christian, you can say that you are the beginnings of the fulfillment of that ideal kingdom that Isaiah prophesied about 2,800 years ago. For those not in Christ Jesus, as Paul put it, well, like the people that Isaiah was addressing in his day, dread of your impending doom is the appropriate response to your situation. But for those in Christ Jesus, you are the ones who get to say, Behold God, God is my salvation. I will trust and I will not dread, because my strength and my song are Yah, Yahweh. He is to me Yeshua, or salvation. Because for you, the price for human sin has already been paid.